Today we're going to finish up our series on baggage. And um, how many were blessed by Jim and, and Jeff's, uh, Jim, Jim uh, Kim and Jeff's story last week? Yeah. Wasn't that awesome? Um, if you ever get a chance to, you know, if they're here and you get a chance to go out to lunch with them and, and have them share some more of that story, uh, you know, uh, like they said, they could have gone on for three hours and, and, and no problem telling their story and how, how things have progressed through the years. But, but it's a powerful thing when God, God does something like that in your life and tragedy hits you and God gets you to the other side. How many know that fire hits our lives sometimes? And how many know that, 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 God is always there in the fire with us. He always is. And so, uh, so it was awesome to hear their story of, of victory and where God's got them today. And, and again, we'll have them back in the future. I, I'm pretty excited about what God's doing in their life right now. But if you didn't, if you weren't here and you didn't get a chance to watch that, it's still, um, you can go to Facebook. It's still, I think it's still on Facebook, but also it's on our YouTube channel and, and you can go to our website to find that. Uh, but anyway, uh, check that out. It, it, it will bless you. Um, we got several passages uh, to look at today, and and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, I, I I'm gonna, I, um, the the name of the message today is is freedom from self reliance, and I, I know that's a this is a I I, I was like Lord, are you sure freedom from, from this is this is not only America, this is Texas. That's kind of an oxymoron in Texas, right? And, and and so the Lord um, uh, the Lord laid this on my heart and and um, and so we're gonna go there and so you can turn to several different places we're gonna go all over Psalm one you just mark that in Psalm Psalm one First Peter five we'll go there we'll also go to Proverbs Proverbs sixteen you can mark that we we'll go to a couple of places in Proverbs Psalm one First Peter five Proverbs sixteen and then we're gonna we're gonna talk uh, uh, about um, the Passover meal, and um, we're going to look at that in Luke, which is in Luke chapter, um, I believe it's Luke 22, and then also um, we'll look at that in Matthew 26. So we're going to look at both of those, uh, um, those accounts, those gospel accounts of, of that event. Um, so let's, let's bow our heads. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for today. I thank you that your word is alive. And God, it does transform us if we'll allow it. God, I pray we're not like the Pharisees who made the word of God of none effect in their life. God, we can read it. But if we never receive it, it'll do little for us. But God, it's alive. It's, it's waiting it's waiting to do something in us. So, Father, I just pray that we come with willing hearts today to receive what you have for us, that our hearts are open, and, God, that you would sow seed and that our hearts, it would find good soil in our hearts and that it would transform us and change us into the image of you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to start today by asking a question. Um, let's say Jesus walks, let's just hypothetically, Jesus walks in here and say he steps up to the stage and he makes a declaration to us all. And, um, and in his declaration, he says that in the near future that all of you are going to be challenged in your faith. I'm talking to the very core of all that you believe. Your world is going to be shaken. Your walk with God is, is going to take a major hit. And when that happens, you will fall away. What would your response be to that declaration from Jesus? <laughs> yeah, look, please help me. Um, I, um, I thought about this and I thought, oh, that's a tough question. That's a, tough, that's a tough thing to think about. What would, what would I respond to Jesus saying, you're going to stumble and you're going to fall? What would my response be? What, what would I say to that? Jesus, I, I've been walking. How, how many has been walking this Christian journey for a long time? 
How many, how many think that there's, you've, been, you've been through battles, you've been through so much, your faith has been tested, you're, you're, you, it, it, but your foundation is so stable on him that there is nothing, there is nothing that could happen that could shake that foundation to the point where, where you would bail. Jesus has this very conversation with his very closest followers. They're in an intimate setting. Let me set the stage. They're, 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 it's during the, 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 what we call the Last Supper. So Jesus has gathered his followers together, just those closest followers. That's all that's there. And he has a very intimate setting. It's, 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 it's a very a small setting, and it's just these few men. And, and this, is, this is the men who had seen Jesus do all these miracles. These are men who had left all to follow him. They were all in. These were all in people. These were people who, who weren't playing games. They weren't riding the fence. They were all in with following Jesus. They had left all to follow him. And so Jesus is in this little setting with his followers. And he has a heart-to-heart conversation with them. And so we're going to take it up in, in Matthew chapter 26, verse 31. And Jesus said to them, all of you, everybody say all. All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter Peter answered and said to him, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never, (laughs) never say never. Um, I will never be made to stumble. Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all, everybody say all, all, the disciples. They were convinced They were convinced that what Jesus declared, Jesus, the Son of God, they all recognized that's who he was, the Messiah. Peter had said it with his, had heard from heaven and said it with his own mouth, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter and all the other disciples say to Jesus when he declares this, no, it's not going to (laughs) happen. I mean, get Think about this. So that's a that's a, I set up this hypothetical situation, but that wasn't a hypothetical situation with the disciples. It was real life, and Jesus declares something. How many know there are times when 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 the word of God goes forth, and there are things that we hear that we really don't want to hear? Is it just me, or, or do you just rebuke those? You just that's that's the get thee behind me, Satan. And there are times when the word of God will challenge us. There are things we don't want to hear, like a promise. All of your promises, all of your promises won't let go of me. We sing that song. Well, here's a promise from Jesus. In this world, you will have tribulation. That's right. Yeah, I, I rebuke that. I don't want that. But that's a promise. That's just as valid as the, the promise that he will return. I never promised you a rose garden, right? There's got to be a little rain sometime, right? Right, right? No, I'm really dating myself with that. Some of you are like, where'd that song come from? That came from a long time ago. He didn't promise us that life would be a smooth ride. We don't like the fire. I don't like it. I don't want to step into a fire. I, I don't. I, I don't want to step in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I don't think that they were, they were trying to be all tough and, and all that. They were just being men of conviction. I don't really want to burn in the fire, but, but I'd rather burn in that fire than the other one. He didn't deliver. He didn't, he didn't keep them out of the fire. He went in the fire with them. <laughs> the disciples are told, you're going to, you're, you're going to, you're going to go through it, and, and, and it's coming. It's coming. Now, the word stumble here in the, in the, in the King James Version is offended, but it's not like, like you're, I'm going to hurt your feelings. It's not that kind of offense. The word is, it comes from a word. I mean, we're going to speak Greek today. 
Um, and you're going to think, that's Greek to me. Um, scandalizo. Say that. Scandalizo. scandalizo. All right, you know a Greek word. Scandalizo. Means to stumble and fall. It means to be offended. It means to begin to distrust and desert one who should be trusted and obeyed. It's like this. It's like a, the idea carries with it like this trap, this bait. And if you fall for it, you're hooked. You will stumble and you will fall. It is set up there. It's a stumbling block. There is something ahead and you're all going to fail in this one. And the disciples are like, no, I ain't. No way. And Peter is like the loudest one. I mean, he's the one that's recorded as like, even if all these other guys, because they probably will, they'll probably fall away. But for me, I, I'm not falling away. Even if I have to die with you, I will, I will die with you. But Jesus declares that it will, that Jesus declares this to all of them. And all of the response, I think a lot of us would probably have that same response. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, man, I've been through the fire a few times with God and, and, and God has always delivered me. There is nothing that can shake me to the core to where I'm, 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 I'm ready to jump off. That's where the disciples thought that they were. They thought that they were really, really, really all in. The truth is that there was an event that shook their faith to the core. Everything that they had put their hope and their trust in seemed to come crashing to the ground. They all responded the same exact way. Now go to Luke chapter 22. There's a Luke's account gives us a few more details and I, and I want to look at this. Peter's statement it seems to indicate that he's a, he's a little more confident in his ability to stay devoted to Jesus than any of the other disciples. And that's important to note because in, in Luke chapter 22, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, um, 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 there's something that Luke brings out in this story that is pertinent. And I, and I want to read this in Luke chapter 22, verse 24. Now, there was, a, there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. Now, this seems to be an ongoing thing. If you read the Gospels, this is not the only time that they have this dispute. This is an ongoing dispute. With the disciples, there was, there was positioning, and there were power struggles, and, and who's the best? And, who, and remember, remember, there were two uh, brothers. I think it was James and John whose mother showed up, right? It was mama. Mama showed up to try to get them in good with Jesus, and, and I can picture that event taking place and all the other disciples making fun of those two. But the truth is that, that, that these guys were constantly jockeying for position. I'm his favorite. No, I'm his favorite. No, 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 no. No, he spends more time with me. No, 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 no. I'm a, you know, and, and so there's this constant dispute. There's this argument. And constantly throughout the Gospels, we are told that this is an ongoing thing. And so it, it, it's also something that they're having a conversation with during the Last Supper. It's the mo this is the most precious time for Jesus. He's about to be arrested. He's about to be crucified. And they're arguing and disputing about something that doesn't matter. Isn't it like the world? Isn't it like the church today? We're arguing and disputing over things that just don't matter. People are going to hell. I mean, that's, that's the reality. That's the, that's the main thing. That, that there is a God who came to rescue humanity and there's people that don't know him and we're disputing things that just do not matter. And so Jesus speaks to this situation uh, uh, concerning the disciples and this, and he washes their feet and he serves them and he shows them that that's what's great in the kingdom is serving one another. But these guys are constantly, constantly going, uh, going at each other in this ongoing debate. I want to make a note of this because remember Peter's conversation with Jesus where he declares that even if everyone else bails, he will not. He's convinced he's better than the rest of them. I don't know about the rest of these guys, but I can tell you about me right now. I'm with you. I'm with you. Peter is so full of himself. Listen, this is the guy. Peter, Peter is so full of himself that there was a time when he rebuked Jesus. He is so prideful and arrogant that he, listen, he speaks and he says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, Blessed are you, Simon, Simon Barjona. 
My fa- you, you didn't hear, flesh and blood didn't reveal to you that, but, but my Father in heaven, you heard from heaven, way to go. And then, and then the, next, the next part of that conversation, Jesus starts to talk about how he's going to suffer and how he's going to die. And Peter's like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. And I can see this kind of playing off like Peter, like saying, hey, Jesus, can you come over to my office here? We need to have a chat here. You're talking about dying and stuff. It's going to mess with the other guy's head, you know? I can see him having this conversation. Listen, I don't know about the other guys, but we got your back, you know? I, don't, I know they don't look like much, but J- John, James and John, they're the sons of thunder. You, if you're going in a battle, you want them in your fight with you, man. So we're going we're gonna, to, we got your back. No more talking about dying and suffering and all that. He rebukes Jesus. Why? Because he's convinced, he's convinced that he's hearing from heaven. And he's all that. And Jesus, in the, I mean, Jesus barely takes a breath after saying that you're, bl- you're blessed and that you heard from heaven. He barely takes a breath and says, get thee behind me, Satan. Peter gets all puffed up. How many's ever done something good and you got a little big head? Woo! <laughs> Peter is, is convinced that he is, he is um, he's the right hand man and he rebukes the Son of God. How prideful do you have to be to do that? Now, now look at go down to verse 31. And the Lord said. I think this is interesting. He doesn't say Peter. He doesn't call him Peter here. I got to think Peter takes note of that. Why? Because he always referred to him as Peter. He was no longer Simon. He's now Peter. But in this instance, as Peter's like, no, 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 no. Hey, hey, hey. I'm not leaving you. I'm not bailing on you. Me and you, we're tight. There ain't nobody getting in between us. I, I, I'll die for you. I, I am, I am going to take care of you. The Lord said, Simon, Simon. Reed, shaky reed. Blown by the wind. Indeed, Satan has asked for you. That he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, in other words, you're going to be sifted, brother. Satan has asked permission to sift you. And he's going to sift you. And when you've returned, which means you have to go in order to return, you're going to fall, you're going to stumble, you're going to fall away. But when you've returned, this is what a, this, this, his instructions When you've returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny three times that you know me. Pride, self-reliance, looking at yourself. This idea of pride is having this elevated, this exaggerated idea or, or estimate of yourself and your own ability. Peter was convinced he was this he-man, master of the universe, second to none. And he failed. He failed miserably. He blew it miserably. But I think it's interesting that that Jesus doesn't say, Peter, you're going to fall away and you're going to get it all back together and you're going to come back to me. No, Jesus says, the enemy's come and he's, he's asked to sift you, but I'm praying for you that your faith does not fail. The only reason why you're going to be able to stand is because I'm, I'm involved in this situation. It's not about you, Peter. It's not about you getting it all together. I'm with you. I'm with you. It ain't, don't get it, don't get it backwards. I think it's interesting that, that when when, um, when uh, they're, they're going out, they're, going, they're about to go out uh, from this place, and they're going into the garden, and Jesus, Jesus makes this, uh, he, they, the, the disciples take, uh, I think it's two knives or two swords with them. And, um, and in this instance, she, and, and they show Jesus, and Jesus is like, that's enough. And I feel like he's saying that'll make the point that I want to make. Because in the garden, Peter, the one that's going to die with him, right? 
Peter, who's so full of himself, so confident in his own ability, listen, he is going to try to save the Savior. Is that backwards? Do you think Jesus needs Peter to save him? But Peter's so confident in his own ability that he pulled, this fisherman pulls out one of these knives and he goes and he chops a soldier's, a Roman soldier, a, a, a guy who's, 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 um, uh, who's trained in the art of war. This fisherman takes out a sword or a knife and chops the guy's head off. Or not his head off, his ear off. And I believe that the reason why he chopped his ear off is because he was a fisherman, not a sword fighter. He missed his neck. <laughs> I can see Peter like, I'll save you. Dun, 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 here I am to save the day. And Jesus is like, you really, dude? You're going to fight the whole Roman army. Right? I mean, think about how ludicrous and how, how, how ridiculous that mindset is. Jesus reaches down, puts the ear back on. He's arrested, and they all bail. They all bail. All of them. They all leave. They all run for the hills. They all save their own tails. They're disillusioned. They're in a place where the very thing that Jesus said was going to happen, happened. How many know that when Jesus speaks, it's the truth? And there are times we don't like it. We don't want to hear what he wants to say or he has to say. How many have been reading the Bible, and you, you read a verse, and you're like, oh, <laughs> Really? Oh, that hurts. I got to do that? Oh, yeah. how many have ever been challenged by the word of God? Proverbs 16, 18, you, have, you don't have to turn there, but Proverbs 16, 18 says this, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. That's, by the way, that's, that's truth. That's, that's truth. You can't skirt around that. Unrepented pride will lead to destruction. If it's not repented of, it's not dealt with, if you don't deal with the pride in your life, it will lead to destruction. It will. Arrogance, a haughty spirit, it will lead you to a fall. Jesus said, you're all going to stumble and fall. Not us! Oh yeah, because you're all that, right? Be careful. Be careful. Here's the thing about pride is it hides and we don't see it. We don't see it. That sounds like true devotion, right? Jesus says, you're all going to stumble and fall. Not me. I'm devoted to you. That's, that's this, false, this false sense of devotion that I am all that, that I've got the strength to stand. It's self-reliance. It's looking to ourself. It's looking to ourself instead of to the strength that only comes from him. You know as well as I do, if you've walked this journey very long at all, there are times when you've got to lean on his strength because you reach the end of your rope. Anybody been there? Oh, yeah. You reach the end of your rope, and you're just hanging on. You tie a knot, and you're like, I'm hanging on for dear life, God. I, I need your strength. I've got no more strength left. And you've got to lean on his strength. Here's the truth. God doesn't want us to get to that place at the end of our rope. He wants to make sure that we get to that place, and that's how we live our life, dependent on him. And whenever we get to this place of self-reliance and, and this area, of, because it's rooted in pride, he got, we open up the door to the enemy. Where was the open door for the enemy? Why did the enemy say, Peter, yeah, he's pretty prideful. Yeah, yeah, go, go ahead. Why? He's got an open door. Pride opens the door to the enemy. I mean, no, that's the original sin. Pride. When we step into pride, we're not, like, we're not like our heavenly father. We're like somebody else. Proverbs 28, verse 25 says this. He who is of a proud heart stirs up strife, but he who trusts in the Lord will be prospered. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool, but whoever walks wisely will be delivered. When we trust in our own ability, in our own heart, well, I'm just going to follow my heart on this way. Really? I, that's not how I want to live my life. I don't know about you, but my heart is wrong sometimes. In fact, most of the time. Deceitfully wicked, Scripture says. It, 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 is, it, is, it is not a good thing to follow your gut. We're to follow the Holy Spirit. We're to have a spirit-driven life. Not, 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 look to, not look to our own. Listen, a lot of times, here's the thing is hearing from God can be so subjective. 
Because a lot of times what we, what we, what we hear is what we want to hear. And that's the thing we, we accept when, when sometimes it's the enemy speaking that. Sometimes it's coming from the own corruption in our own heart. Well, the Lord told me this, and you're like, yeah, how many's ever, ever, ever been there where the, you felt like the Lord told you something, and later on you felt like that wasn't the Lord? Right, because really in the, the, the grand scheme of things, what we want is what we want. What we want is what we want. And so when we're challenged by God in those areas, we're like, Peter, I rebuke you. No, 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 no. Well, I'll not have that. I don't want to listen to that. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. How many times do we trust in our own ability? Now go to 1 first, first Peter. This is the same Peter, by the way, that writes this. 1 Peter chapter 5. He's come full circle. He's, he's done, he did exactly what Jesus said. He fell away. He returned. And, and, then, and then we get to this point in his life where something, something has become revelatory. And it's not just a word he's heard. It's a journey he's taken. I mean, no, that, that when, it's only, when it's only something you've heard, when it's only something you, you've heard, you can, you can be talked out of it by the enemy. But when it's been something you've heard and you've seen it and you've walked it out and it's manifest in your life, there ain't no devil in hell can talk you out of that. That's your testimony. I know this to be true because this is what's happened in my life. And, and I'm here to tell you this is the way this is the way this thing works. And so this is what Peter says in verse, verse uh, 5 of, of chapter 5. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another. This is coming from a guy who was jockeying for position with the other disciples. They weren't mutually submitted. They were jockeying for position. And Peter comes full circle, and now he's, he's living life a different way. He's been on this journey for a while, and he's, he's saying, look, this is the way it works. I understand it now. We're mutually submitted, serving one another in love. That's how it works. And so he's encouraging us. Why Jesus said, when you return, what is he supposed to do? Strengthen your brothers. So what's he doing for us today as he's, as he's pinning this for us? He's saying, look, this is how, this is, I, I'm, I'm strengthening you. I'm encouraging you. Look, I've been there. I've done that. I bought the t-shirt. And this is, this, is, this is what I've learned about God through the process. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility because I wasn't. Right? For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God resists the proud. God's against you if, when you're walking in pride. If God be for us, who can be against us? We quote that scripture, but if we're in pride, that ain't, that ain't, that's not true for you. God resists the proud. Verse 6, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Well, this is coming from a guy who was in a power struggle with the other disciples wanting to be numero uno. And now he's realizing it's God that exalts us in due season. The problem with us is God's due season is much longer than our due season. You know that to be true. I've been there. I've done that. How many jump the gun? He, we, God, God, no one, no one sees me. God, no one sees me down here. I'm so great and wonderful and all that. And so God, no one's tooting my horn. So I got to toot my horn for myself. Why? Because God's taken too long. I, I don't know, but I've been there. And I'll tell you what I figured out that I jumped off the potter's wheel when God was trying to mold me and make me. I've been there. I, I've jumped off where it took years, years to get back where I was. Because I jumped, I jumped the gun. God's, God is, is inspiring Peter to write this. And he's, and he's telling us that, that we're to humble ourselves before God so that he can exalt us in due time. That's how the kingdom works. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. We quote this scripture a lot of times, this next passage. There's no change in thought, by the way. He's pinning this all together. There's no change in thought. Cast all your care on him for he cares for you. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking, seeking whom he may devour. Where is there somebody in pride? 
Where is there somebody in totally self-reliant and trusting in their own ability? Where is that person so that I have an open door? It's all tied together. Be humble. Be humble. Humble yourselves. Submit to one another. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him. Steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while. This is Peter who said, I've been down that road and I suffered a while. So I'm, I'm encouraging with you. And this is, this is what I want for you. I said, after you've suffered for a while. <laughs> That God will perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. How many need to be settled? Because life is a whirlwind. And you're trying to settle it down. I need the world to settle down. And, and, and Peter's encouraging us. He's saying, let God settle you. Let God establish you. Let God strengthen you. See, in Peter, Peter's own ability, he's going to pull out the sword and he's going to fight. He's going to fight. He's going to chop off a guy's ear and then they're going to, they're going to, they're going to arrest him and kill him because, because he's, he can't take them all on in his own strength and his own ability. He can't pull this off. He can't even stand for, he can't even stand for Christ on his own. It has to be Christ in him. I think it's interesting that it's after the day of Pentecost that Peter goes through a radical change in his life because the Spirit of God now dwells on the inside of him and it's now the Spirit of God in him that he finds his strength in. It's not in himself. Peter was not established by his own strength. The, verse, the 11th verse says, To him... Be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. If you do it by yourself, you get a pat yourself on the back and you get the glory. And Peter's saying, I found a different way to live life. It's where he gets the glory. It's where it's not of me, but it's him. In the same way that we get saved, that's how we're to live our life, trusting and relying on him. And I know this is a difficult, difficult topic in the United States of America where we are independent. In the state of Texas where we can be independent, if we just break away from the United States, we'd be all right on our own, right? We're like the super independent, independent people. And yet in the kingdom, there's a different way to live life. And so let me break this down. Let me, let me break this down and, 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 and relate it to us a little bit. Um, today. Pride is having an over-exaggerated estimate of one's merits, means, or abilities. It's this arrogance. Seeing oneself as, as better than others. You got to be better than others because that's how you measure yourself. <laughs> how do I know that I struggle with pride or self-reliance? Let me just throw out some some thoughts and as we get ready to wrap this up. Uh, I, I can be a workaholic. Anybody in the room? When you've worked and you worked and you worked and it still seems like at the end of the month you never have enough. Anybody been there? So your default is because you're a workaholic, your default is you just got to work harder. Right? You just gotta, you just gotta, you gotta, you gotta grab the bulls by the horn and you gotta do what you gotta do. A man's gotta do what a man's gotta do or, or, or a mom's gotta do what a mom's gotta do. And, and so you get to this place where, where you're trusting in your own ability. You're working hard and, and you, and, and then you work more hours and more hours and more hours and more hours and, and you still seem to never have enough and you're trying to figure out how, why in the world? Anybody ever been to the place where, where you feel like everything you touch doesn't, doesn't, does, nothing good comes from it? 
We're going to read this scripture in a minute that says that everything I do, that everything I set my hand to will prosper. How many of you ever felt like everything you set your hand to is cursed? Anybody been there? And you're trying to, God, what's going on? And you work harder. You work harder. Let me just say this. When, that is, when that's your MO, when that's how you do life, and then what happens is you just load yourself up with some baggage and you put the shoulder, you put the baggage on your shoulder, the weight on your shoulders that I'm going to take care of this. God's not doing this. God's not, God, God, I know you said in your word that you would take care of us and that you would provide, that you are Jehovah Jireh, the God that provides, but, but God, it's not working out. So, so I'm going to help you out a little bit. And so we put that weight on our shoulders. That's self-reliance. That doesn't work in the kingdom. It doesn't mean that we're lazy. Scripture says that what we set our hand to, God will prosper. God will bless it. How many want God to breathe on what you do? You got to do something, by the way. You got to set your hand to do something. It's not that it's not this sit around and do nothing type of lifestyle, but it's like this, this, this concept that whatever I set my hand to, God's in it with me. But our default is often, I got I to get this done. I got to put this weight on my shoulders. Listen to me. I am not the provider for my family. God is the provider for my family. I'm just working with him. And I understand the scripture that says, if I don't provide for my own family, that's, that's, that's not a good thing. I want you to understand that if I'm not in line with what, what God's doing, if I'm not allowing him and inviting him to be a part of this with me, then I, am, I have taken on the weight of that on myself. And I am no different than the disciples who thought that they were all that. I can't carry the weight of my world. I wasn't designed to. That's why he went to the cross. God wants us to get rid of the baggage. Well, nothing I'm doing is working. Nothing seems to be working. There are times in our lives where, where me and Lori will get to a place where, where we're in, um, how many of you ever been in, um, in desperation mode when it came to finances? Anybody been there? There have been times in our lives when we've been in desperation mode and, and we finally pray. And she's like, maybe we should pray. And I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding you. There have been times when we have prayed, and within 24 hours, there's an answer. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing what happens when we lean on him. Rather than go into freak-out mode. Perhaps you're struggling in your marriage because your needs aren't being met by your spouse. That's a problem in marriages. In fact, most marriages end because needs aren't being met. So many take it upon themselves to step outside of the marriage relationship to get those needs met. They find, they find, uh, they find that comfort somewhere else. Maybe, maybe it is in, 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 in this idea of, of, of diving into work like crazy so that you can avoid, <laughs> you can avoid your spouse. Come on, people do that. There's, they, they, go to, they, do, uh, they have all kinds of escapes. And when we do that, we're taking it upon ourselves. God, you're not meeting. You're not doing this. I'm not getting my needs met. So what you're doing is... Is you're taking on your you're taking on your shoulders the weight of your needs getting met. God, I'm going to have to step outside of uh, outside of your your guidelines because it's not working for me. You're just like the disciples. When that happens, he is El Shaddai. He's the one that meets all of our needs. That's who he is. That's his nature. If your needs aren't being met, who are you run into? I, I got to say this. Listen, I understand that in a marriage relationship, there are needs that are met by your spouses. I, I get that. But if you got into this thing because you needed your needs met, you got into it for the wrong reasons. You got to reevaluate and, 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 and realize that a marriage relationship isn't about your needs getting met. It's about meeting the other person's needs. That's what love is. <laughs> the encouragement to, to husbands was to lay down your life for your bride. That doesn't sound like my needs getting met in that moment. It's not about me. Listen, I, I've been there. I understand. When we step outside, listen, when David sinned with Bathsheba, did you, if you'll ever read the response by, by the, what comes through Nathan, the prophet, the word of the Lord that comes to the prophet Nathan, he says, 
God says to him, through the prophet Nathan, he says, I gave you the kingdom. I gave you wives. I, gave, I, take, I took you from being a shepherd to being a king. And God says, if it had not been enough, I would have done it even more. In other words, if you were to look to me to meet your needs, I am capable of pulling that off. But instead, you took it on yourself. Self-reliance, I got to do this on my own. Take up that baggage and we carry it around. Perhaps you've been mistreated. Someone says something hurtful and, and when that happens, your default is to defend yourself. I got to defend myself. Yeah, God said, I want to be your defender. I am your defender. Yeah, God, I, I got this. Take a seat, big guy. That's how, that's, that's the attitude we have when we say, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do this, my, I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to, you, God, you just, you just lay back for a minute. Let me take care of this. That's pride. When we don't forgive somebody that's hurt us, we've been offended, and we don't, what we want is we want justice. They did this, and they deserve to be punished for it. That is us standing in the seat of judge, of judge and jury. That is God's seat. That is, that is pride. Instead of releasing that person and saying, God, I give this over to you. I don't want to carry that baggage. I can't carry that. It exhausts me. It wears me out. I don't know about you, but when I carry baggage around, it exhausts me. It wears me out. And God's trying to get us to a place where we are totally dependent on him and we find his rest by getting rid of the baggage, not taking it all on ourselves. Perhaps you're single in this place and you've prayed for a mate, but, and you've been trusting God, but it's taken a little while. I can relate. I didn't get married till I was 33. I, I can relate. I, I, I've been there. I've been there thinking maybe it's not going to happen. Maybe I'm just never, ever going to get married. Maybe there's not somebody out there for me. I, I've been there. I know what it's like to get antsy and to want to step outside. I'm not saying, look, look, look. I'm not saying you don't be, pro, you're not to be proactive. Guys, if, if, um, if you don't ask her to marry you, you're not, probably not going to happen right? I mean, you got to be proactive. You got to throw, you got to, you got to take some risks out there. Right, so I'm not saying we don't do anything. I'm just saying, let's not, let's not get in front of God. Let's not jump the gun and say, okay, God, you're not doing this. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to have to step out there and take this on my own shoulders. God, I'm going to have to do this myself. And so then what happens is you start making compromises and before long you've messed up and, and you look back and you're like, how did this happen? I'll tell you how it happened. You quit letting him take the, take the reins. You took the baggage on your own shoulders and you carried the weight of that. And now you got the result of that. And what's the result of pride and arrogance? Destruction. That's what happens. God's word is true. Pride will always lead to destruction. Self-reliance will always end up being empty. Let me wrap up with this. I go to Psalm chapter one. I want to read just a few verses. And let's go back to that first illustration I made about working. I hope this is hitting home with you. I hope it's relating to you today. At least three of you. That's good. Psalm one. So... It, there's a fine line. This self-reliance thing is, it's, it's a, there's a fine line and we struggle with it because we, we've been blessed in America. We've been so blessed. Yeah. We've been so blessed. But if we're not careful, we become so dependent on everything else. Scripture says that it's very difficult, right? It's, in fact, it's impossible. It's impossible. On your own, but but I, I think about this. It's, it's a, for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Compared to the rest of the world, we're rich, and we can become so dependent on everything else that we don't need him, or we think that's our attitude. I can, I'll take care of this on my own. I've, I heard somebody say this one time. Why would I pray for God to do something for me that I could do for myself? And I thought about that. That sounds really good. 
That, that sounds very logical. That's not kingdom thinking, though. That's not how God wants us to operate. God wants us to lean on him. He's a good father. He's a good father. I have a, I have a great, I had a great father. And I have a great father-in-law. My father-in-law rarely lets me pay for anything. When we go, to, we go to a restaurant, I generally have to do a preemptive strike to get the bill. I have to go and I have to get up, excuse myself, I have to go find the waiter, wherever the waiter is, and I have to say, I need the check. Because even if I grab the check at the table, he, puts, he pulls this old, um, this father-in-law, this fatherly thing, right? Where you got re- to respect your elders, right? And so he's like, give me that. You know, and he will take it from me. And listen, listen, I don't need him to do that. I don't need him to do that. He just does it because he's a good father. There are things in my life that I don't just, I don't have to have. But God will bless me with them anyway. Why? Because he's a good father. I could work my life to the bone. And in the end, it's never enough. I always say this, that I try to I try to squeeze 27 hours into 24 hours. It doesn't work. At the end of every 24 hours, it's never enough time. And at the end of the month, there's never enough money to do all the things I want to do. I'm not a selfish guy, but I have dreams and I have vision. There are things that God's placed on the inside of me that's going to take, that's going to take, that's going to take millions of dollars to accomplish for the kingdom. I cannot do it on my own. I struggle. I struggle from month to month sometimes to pay everything that's got to be paid. I feel like, and maybe this relates to some of you, but I feel like constantly we've come out of Egypt and we have no concept of what the promised land is all about. And we're wandering around in the wilderness and the manna in the morning is great, but it was never meant to be forever. I love the fact that God is a good, good father. And he provides all of our needs. We have a roof over our head. Our bills are paid. We're we're never late. Most of the time. I'm on the stage preaching. I better tell the truth. But we, you know what I'm saying? I, and I read this passage of scripture in Psalm 1. The word of God is true. It's true. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. I don't, I don't look for advice. I don't look for good advice outside of him. Nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He shall Be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The word prosper, in case you want to know what that means, means to be successful. Whatever you do would be successful. Who wants to do something that's going to be a failure? Left to our own devices, that's what it measures up to. But with him breathing on it, it's him breathing on it so that he gets the glory. And so we recognize and we step back. The only reason why this is working is because God's breathing on it. It's not because I woke up early in the morning and I worked my fingers to the bone. Yeah, I'll do my part and I'll do whatever it takes, but it's because of God's genius, not me. God gets the glory. It means to succeed. It means to be profitable. 
I had a businessman one time that I worked for, and, and he would always have these people that would try to do these deals to try to get more deals. And in getting that deal, they would lose money. And he would be like, that's stupid. I didn't get in business to lose money. I don't work so that there's no reward at the end of the day. I don't do that. I work expecting God to breathe on it. Proverbs 10, says this, the blessing of the Lord makes one rich and he adds no sorrow with it. <laughs> he adds no sorrow with it. There are wealthy, wealthy, wealthy people that are miserable. And God's saying, I, I, can, I can bless you to where you're not worried and stressful and freaked out all the time. I can bless you and bring no sorrow with it. That's my, that's the kingdom way of doing it. <laughs> the word rich means rich. It means wealthy. Malachi 3, you probably know this scripture. Verse 10, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me now in this as the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. I, I, I think there's people in this place that you're loaded down with things that you've put on your own shoulders and you think you can fix it. I had a lawnmower that I thought could make it one more year. And I started piddling with it and I couldn't fix it. I actually started Googling how much new lawnmowers were going to cost. Walked outside and my father-in-law had taken it apart. And um, I had given up on it. I was ready to bury it. He had taken it apart. And he began to piddle with it. And he worked on it for several days. And he tried this and he tried that and he tried this. It's an old lawnmower. And um, I was carrying the weight of that thing on my shoulders. I got to buy a new lawnmower. I can't fix this. Thing. I can't fix it. I don't know how to fix it. I don't know what's wrong with it. What I tried didn't work. I can't fix it. And it was two days ago. I heard a noise outside. It started up. It started up. We mowed the lawn yesterday with our lawnmower. Here, here's the point I want to make with that story is my father fixed it. He fixed it. Some of us are carrying weights around and we're trying to fix things on our own. And God's saying, if you bring that, and we've been doing this almost every week. The thing that I think we need freedom from more than anything is this over-exaggerated estimation of what we can do compared to who he is and what he can do. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads this morning. I've gone a little late this morning, but I hope it's been good. We should ask the Holy Spirit, what are you, he's ministering to you today about? Is, is there pride in your heart? Ask him. God, is there pride? Is there an area of pride in my heart? Is my default to take the weight on my shoulders to fix my world? The Lord saying, let it go today. Humble yourself before God. Cast all your care on Him. That word care is anxiety and worry. And that concept of that scripture is, He'll take care of it for you. So He's the Father and He's saying, you need something fixed? I'm fixing it. I'm fixing it. 
I'm fixing it. Whatever it is this morning, he's fixing it. It may not happen in the time frame you want it to happen. I, I'm not going to have the prayer team come today because this is right now, right where you're at. Just give it to him right now. Just lay it down and give it to him. Let him fix it. Say, God, I'm tired of fixing it or trying to fix it. I release it to you right now. Whatever it is. There's some of you that have dreams and visions and you can't, you've tried and tried and tried and tried and tried to make it happen. God's saying, in due season, in due season, let it go. Some of you are struggling financially and God's saying, can I have that? I can fix it. Some of you, your marriage is falling apart and God's saying, can I have that? I'll fix it. You got to listen, you got to obey me, but I'll fix it. Some of you are sick in your body and you're worried, you're stressed out. And God's saying, can you, can you hand me that? Because I'll fix that. I'll carry that care. I'll carry the weight of that for you. You weren't designed to carry it. Give it to me. And ask Corey just to lead us in a course as Brent comes to dismiss. Just give it to him today. Just give it, give it all to him. Let go of all the weight. Cast your care on him because he cares for you.